but onto something. The knife was always the highlight of Genesis live in concert. And if you look at the early footage... A very potent uh, stage performance. And it was proof, really, that Genesis could make their somewhat cerebral musical style. Energy, um, sort of throbbing bass, fantastic drumming. Um, it, was, it was probably as heavy as Genesis were ever going to get, but it's a very exciting piece of music. The Knife was the song that got Genesis signed to Charisma. They were doing a lot of new stuff in their act, and it was a very impressive kind of statement of intent, something to do with the, the revolution, which was a big thing back in the 60s. We, we all had posters of Che Guevara on the wall. And uh, I think really what they were saying was, uh, rather like Pete Townsend, it's uh, meet the new boss, same as the old boss, the idea that uh, the revolutionaries of today are the uh, dictators of tomorrow. So. It was a song with a message, they got uh, a musical backdrop to go with it that hammered the point home and uh, it was the song more than anything else that really got Charisma interested in signing the band. Stagnation is quite a wonderful track, it's, and it really does have the style of very old Genesis, a la the first album, um, but you can definitely hear the later Genesis traits coming through, and it, yeah, it really is quite a beautiful piece of music. The idea of building a song via a couple of acoustic guitars and a tinkling piano in between, sort of lulling the listener into dreamy world, and then gradually uh, more electric guitars and a beat comes into play and drives the song forward, um, reaching one climax after another. And this idea of repeatedly building the climax and then taking it back down again. were very much about a nuclear apocalypse which everyone was worried about with uh, America and Russia having been neck and neck with brinkmanship and who was going to fire the first nuke. It's something we obviously were not uh, perhaps so worried about now but back in those days it was certainly something that a teenager would worry about. Would they grow up to have children? Would they grow up to have a family? Could they do everything that they wanted to do before basically the end of the world came? Um, Anthony Phillips I know was not really keen on the result of stagnation. I think he felt that there should have been more time spent in putting the thing together. But there's a certain eerie feel to it, a kind of eerie keyboard feel that, uh, with Tony Banks obviously coming to prominence, which he was in the early days. Um, I think it did make for a very post-apocalyptic sound and uh, certainly I would say it was quite effective. Beyond the skies, the time.
Box was the only song that Genesis had written and performed live before they started recording. It uses the same theme of stagnation in building instrumental climaxes repeatedly, um, but this time the music perfectly mirrors the dark undertow of Peter Gabriel's lyrics. Without doubt, the musical box is the highlight of the Nursery Crime album. It's probably also one of the highlights of the entire. Genesis career. Musical Box is a, a fantastic track um, on the album, but I don't think it was the actual highlight of the album. It's a wonderful piece of storytelling. It's got a, a lovely texture of Victoriana. It's quirky. It's interesting musically. It's beautifully arranged. And for me, it stands the test of time amazingly well. <laughs> Peter Gabriel's skill in the musical box is drawing you into the story by making you feel that you've perhaps missed the first part of it. So you're constantly trying to pick up um, back references which he provides and gradually the song builds in this way. It also is helped immeasurably by having Phil Collins providing a professional solid beat behind it. What I remember about it really is Phil Collins taking it by the scruff of the neck and doing a bit of a Keith Moon which certainly John Mayhew, the drummer that they had before, technically didn't really have the, the balls in his playing to do that. A musical box works well because it's got sort of little tranquil Genesis parts that only early Genesis could do and also the very exciting vibrant progressive feel. It's, it's a, it's a dynamite piece of, of work. Everything works in the musical box. The story is uh, succinct and well told. It's very uh, unusual and quirky. But the musical arrangements are absolutely sublime. Again, you've got to look to the, the, the quality of the work from Tony Banks. And Steve Hackett makes an immediate and dramatic impact on his arrival in the band. The musical box takes its time to build. But once it's hit its first peak, Steve Hackett steams in with his first real guitar solo in Genesis and suddenly adds a whole new dimension to the band's range of sounds. The final climax of the song, after over 10 minutes, is perhaps one of the finest that Genesis ever achieved. Um, and not surprisingly, it became the finale to their set for several years. She's a lady, she's got time. No brush brush your hair. If you look at, at Gabriel, you really need to see the early footage to really understand just how good a performer he was uh, when he was performing the Genesis material. Because if you look at, for example, the old man section in the musical box. It doesn't really come across as well on record, but on stage Gabriel really adopts the persona of the old man and gets under the skin of that character and he's able to really project 
this sense of aging and, and sort of almost lechery that's under the under the surface there. And it's only when you see him on stage that you really appreciate just what a fine performer Gabriel was and how well he could uh, interpret those songs. It had all the elements that old Genesis fans tend to treasure. Um, it did stay in the set for quite a while. It was a set piece. It was something that they were keen to get over, and it's not something that they would put away easily. But uh, yeah, it was a highlight of the early days, and I would say certainly the advent of Phil Collins was really what made it so special. <laughs> Return of the Giant Hogweed is a jaunty genesis. It's almost like the Day of the Triffids, set in a sort of Victorian melodrama. The story in the song unfolds to some surprisingly funky rhythms for Genesis. We start off with this keyboard and guitar riff in harmony with each other. Um, and the, the riff is very busy, and it's meant to be describing this giant hogweed that sort of attacks and rampages the human race. So it's, it's maybe a little bit too busy, but that's, that's the way it was intended. Uh, and the two instruments in harmony, very close harmony, getting this kind of this sense of sort of something ominous is going to happen. Songs like Hogweed work uh, in musical terms because of the strength of the arrangements. You know, Tony Banks was crafting these amazingly well-structured and well-organised arrangements. <laughs> The piece is in G major but it starts off in C minor and we get this kind of chromatic run that moves the way down so it actually ends up in G, although the song starts in C minor. And we get these two riffs um, in harmony with each other that um, are just, just work so well. is something that did take on a life of its own. They wanted it to replace The Knife, and The Knife was a song that typically ended the show, so it had to be a real build-up climax. And Hogweed did that. Um, one of the reasons it did was because Steve Hackett, who was now playing guitar instead of Anthony Phillips, was putting his stamp on the proceedings, and he was a very able guitarist in the mould of Robert Fripp from King Crimson. Steve Hackett's guitar playing is, is fantastic, and if you listen to the track carefully, you'll hear that you know, he's got his solo work in there, which, which, is, which is, I think, overshadowed often by the keyboard playing, but also he plays what in some terms, in today's world, we call rhythm guitar, or rhythm background guitar. He's, he's got a grungy feel in there, Steve Hackett's solo in The Return of the Giant Hogweed sets his style quite neatly in that he plays quite melodically, but at the end of the phrase he'll add a deliberate dissonance which takes it away from anybody else. You can't say that it's copying another guitarist. You've got this incredibly creative use of the guitar with this little 
chugging guitar uh, obligato, I suppose, that Steve Hackett delivers. It really is uh, very unusual and, and musically very stimulating. He presses part on the song, he leaves imprints on the song, and certainly the solo at the end of Giant Hogweed is still one of the ones that his fans will remember him for in a Genesis context. <laughs> Steve Hackett brought a kind of double-edged sword to Genesis. He was the guitarist they desperately needed. His sound gave them a new element um, in their expanded repertoire of sounds, which was very important in terms of the way they built their songs. He also had a distinctive style of his own, and he gave Genesis a sort of credibility among guitarists. He didn't have a desire to push himself to the forefront. So Genesis were able to do something which was different from everybody else. They didn't have loud wailing guitar solos. They had the guitar woven into the structures of the songs. And that's what, gave, that's what was the essence of Genesis. I think Steve Hackett felt that he was never really accepted by the others, regardless of whether or not he actually was. And he let that bother him. Um, if Phil Collins, who joined at the same time, felt the same thing, he didn't let it bother him. Typically Genesis were working on 8 to 10 minute pieces at this period and they were really, really at the very top of their game. They were these wonderful symphonic arrangements which uh, were driven largely by Tony Banks' unique ability. Tony Banks called a song like Fountain of Salmasis an odyssey rather than a song. It was a, a story that went from A to B and perhaps people weren't necessarily sure where it was going to go ended up where it ended up, um, could be a little bit different each night when they were playing it. Fountain of Salmasis was the first song that Tony Banks worked on after he'd bought a Mellotron. It was in fact King Crimson's third Mellotron. Um, and he found that it added another range of sounds to his particular keyboard armory. In the introduction of the Fountain of Salmasis we get this wonderful Mellotron string flush of, uh, of the chords, these two chords, C major 7 and D, um, and the Mellotron starts and then it, it's faded up and off again. And then we get this, this running um, riff at the top which goes
Jenny Banks was able to give Fountain of Salmasis a more formal structure in terms of chords, but a broader structure in terms of the sounds that he could produce. And that combined with the gentle, jazzy, swinging section in the middle gave the song real life and vitality. <laughs> Fountain of Salamis, a fantastic track, um, and there's some great bass playing in there. Fountain of Salamis is perhaps the first song where Mike Rutherford fully explores the possibilities of his own bass playing. Michael Rutherford has always been an inspired bass player, and in addition we have these wonderful bass pedals, which just adds that extra kind of secret element to the Genesis sound that shouldn't be overlooked. He follows each change within the song by coming up with an appropriate line that's inventive and moves from the hard, static rock riffs to the more flowing elements of the song. And he keeps pace with that magnificently. Musically, Nursery Crime was a great step forward for the band, but in commercial terms, it didn't really sell any more than the previous album, Trespass, had sold. I think it did show a step on from Trespass, and of course, with Foxtrot coming up, that was going to be another quantum leap for Genesis. Nursery Crime is an album now, you know, over 30 years later, and you go back and listen to the early Genesis albums, I think it's one of the most listenable of the Gabriel albums.
With Watcher of the Skies, Genesis are finally in your face. Uh, the two chords that Tony Banks opens the song with, that he repeats in various shapes and sizes, really set the tone for the whole album. A Watcher of the Skies became, you know, a, a live mainstay, and it's a, it's a brilliant track. It sort of set the tone and the style with this mystery and this uh, the storytelling of Gabriel and the costumes and the, the whole mood of a Genesis concert. It became the opener, uh, not just to Foxtrot the album, but also on stage. And it really does capture the excitement and the essence of what Genesis were about. It's as if Genesis have worked out all the elements that they know work best and piled them all together. And yet, given them space as well, it doesn't feel as if the song lasts for seven and a half minutes because your attention is constantly drawn by something new. And even with 30 seconds to go and the song building to the final ultimate climax, they've still got something new to throw into the pot. The song clearly had something, and in fact it was written by uh, Tony and Mike, I think when they were touring in Italy, they uh, looked out from their hotel and they envisaged a kind of a, a moonscape or something, and certainly the, the sound of the track sounded a bit like a spaceship landing, so if you came into a Genesis gig and suddenly you had the noise of a spaceship landing, that was something that took you onto a, another level. Off on one flight of fantasy after another. It's a progressive epic. Um, and it's not an epic in, in the sense that, in a progressive way, the way Emerson, Lake and Palmer played, or Yes played, there's a real story to what they do. And I think a lot of Genesis early music was like that. You had a story, and a very well told story, and that was one of Gabriel's real traits. Supper's Ready um, is a 22 minute long song, and um, to be honest, to actually maintain a listener's attention for that amount of time, you've got to really come up with something quite special. Um, and I think Genesis did this in this case. It's probably the band almost reaching their peak as a unit. The, the storytelling is interesting and varied. The arrangements are wonderful. So with Supper's Ready, um, the first track, Lover's Leap, um, it's a wonderful kind of love song really, very, um, very powerful lyrics I think. Um, but it starts off um, with an A minus six chord, which is quite an unusual chord to start off any song really. And the song is in B major. Then for the chorus, um, we have this modulation passage which sort of moves through a couple of keys into um, B flat major. So it's quite an unusual thing to do, start off in B, and then instead of going up for the chorus, it's actually moving down one semitone, but because of this fantastic modulation, um, it doesn't feel like it's going down, it feels like it's going up. Shoppers 
It was a typical song that they had then in as much as it was several songs within a song. Several ideas shoehorned together, building up to the big apocalypse in 9-8. When we come to the apocalypse in 9-8 section, you have this real sense of menace which comes from the unusual quirky time signature allied to the arrangement. So it's not something that's done for the sake of it, it's done to achieve a musical effect. Supper's Ready is an elaborate construction, but it's one that the band can perform with ease because it constantly harks back to their own core values and therefore it's easy for them to do. This was really a bit of a manifesto from Genesis and it was also something that the critics hated. So if you were a fan, it was something to love. If you were a critic, it really reinforced all the negative thoughts that you had about Genesis. Foxtrot was the breakthrough album for Genesis in Britain and Europe. It also provided them with a launch pad for America. I think it's interesting if you look at Genesis's early music, i.e. The, the Gabriel and Hackett years, almost every album they did was a clear improvement on the previous album. Not a classic, but certainly it brought all the elements together in a much more cohesive way than we'd seen before. It had uh, the artwork by Richard Whitehead, who was uh, the chief designer of Time Out, if I remember rightly. At that point, uh, the, the artwork and the band and the music were all considered by the fans of a piece, and Peter Gabriel would take some of his visual clues from the artwork, and Foxtrot more than others. He took the fox's head and the red dress, and he went on stage with them, created a little bit of a stir. Didn't tell the band about it either, so they were as shocked as the audience were and it really uh, helped him kick ahead as a focal point and a character. The costumes uh, that Peter Gabriel adopted were a revelation at the time. When we look at uh, the famous red dress and fox's head which he would uh, suddenly appear as, uh, it added a, a sense of what was considered to be real shock at the time, but it brought this huge sense of theatre to the stage. And that's what Gabriel was very good at. He was a brilliant communicator. People who picked up on the group buying the Foxtrot album, and a lot of people did, within six months they would also have bought the Nursery Crime album and were then waiting eagerly for what was to follow. 
I am the voice of Britain before the Daily Express. My name is Britannia. This is my song. It's called Dancing with the Moonlit Night. Can you tell me where my country lies? Cried the uniform to his true love's eyes. It lies with me, cried the Queen of Maybe. Signed on Father Thames, it seems he's drowned, selling England by the pound. Dancing with the Moonlight Night takes a somewhat romanticized view of English life um, in contrast to the commercialized 70s, if you like. Um, hence the phrase, Selling England by the Pound. Dancing in the Moonlight Night was almost a title track for Selling England by the Pound because it was so quintessentially English. The title of the album had actually come from the Labour Party manifesto for an election and so there's a little bit of cynicism in there and that came over in the, the lyrics here because we were looking at the sort of a slightly cynical view of, of English society, the deterioration of society and how things were going down the tubes. Does it succeed musically? Absolutely. It's probably, the, it's probably the best song that Genesis has ever recorded that could foreseeably be played on radio. Dancing with the Moonlit Night um, is in C sharp minor um, and for me the special part of the song is really the, the sort of the Steve Hackett um, guitar riff. It's, it's so simple but it's, it's so um, provocative I think that's the word. Um, and it, it sort of encapsulates what the, what the track is about, really. While the band take their time to build, when the song finally does reach its climax, it's perhaps one of the most powerful and yet concise peaks that the band have ever played. Unfortunately, right at the end, they do tend to cram a bit too much into it. It's the first time that you perhaps hear something of an overload in Genesis instrumentally. Great live track, great if you ever heard it on the radio, but it wasn't overly long, so I don't think people ever lost interest in it. And the dynamics of the song were almost second to none with anything Genesis had ever done before, and I think anything that Genesis ever tried to follow up with. There's always been an echo. Jacob, wake up, you've got the tidy in work now. I think Mr. Lewis, it's in the time that he was out of his own. Over the garden wall, two little numbers.
I Know What I Like in Your Wardrobe came out of a jam session. Um, it started with a Steve Hackett riff, which was very Beatles-y in tone. But Genesis were able to turn it their own way. It was a song that had the slightly off-kilter appeal of something that maybe Jethro Tull might have done, living in the past, the same kind of hop, skip and a jump that the best Jethro Tull had. Typical of Genesis in many ways with the, the, you know, the vocal, the lyrics and, and the way they put it together musically. Personally it's not my favourite on the album but I can see why they chose it as a single and I think it was a very, very good choice as a single and it works well on the album. I Know What I Like In Your Wardrobe could have been a bigger single if Genesis had actually appeared on top of the pops. They never did. Nobody's quite sure whether it's because they refused, which I think they like to tell people they did, um, or whether they just couldn't fit it into their touring commitments. I think they recognised quite early on that they did have a potential hit on their hands, um, but it, they tended to be somewhat embarrassed by it. Genesis weren't about having hits at that particular time. Hit singles were sort of scorned and looked down upon, but Genesis suddenly found they did have a workable single, so why not put it out? You've got to realise that Genesis fans were certainly album-buying fans. They weren't people who bought seven-inch singles by The Sweet or Gary Glitter, and in many ways perhaps going on top of the pops would have been a retrograde step for Genesis because they'd have risked alienating the fans who stuck with them from uh, the beginning. But of course, having a hit brought Genesis to a whole new audience uh, who were, by 1974, quite receptive to the music that Genesis was playing. In a sense, the rest of the music world had caught up with what Genesis had been doing. And it provided them with another s stronger fan base. <laughs> Selling England by the Pound is perhaps one of the great underrated Genesis albums. I think Selling England by the Pound was the best album Genesis has ever done. Just the best. <laughs> it stood the test of time well. It still repays a listen. Anytime you go back and listen to Selling England by the Pound, you'll find some tremendous things that you'd overlooked or forgotten about. Musically, it was, it was certainly a carry-on from Nursery Crime in Foxtrot, but I think the songs were, were more cleverly integrated, and it wasn't that it was a concept album, they just seemed to follow on very, very well. Um, and, and, you know, that, that is as much as arranging the tracks in order, in other words, finding your track listing when you're first putting your album together. Something as simple as that can actually make the difference between a good album and an extremely good album. And I think they got it right with this one.
The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway wasn't a hit out of the box. It's something that I think has grown in stature over the years. Certainly the fact it was the last thing that Peter Gabriel did with the band. I think The Lamb was a fitting swan song for the Gabriel years. Uh, Gabriel had really taken his, uh, his work with Genesis as far as he could and it really was time for him to begin to embark on his career as a solo performer. The Lamb saw Peter Gabriel take on the role of Rail, who was uh, a guy who was trying to make his life in New York City an immigrant. And uh, on stage he'd basically play the part of Rail and he'd be going around in a leather jacket with his hair greased back looking a bit like a thug. Certainly it wasn't the sort of thing that he'd been dressing up in before. Um, but the payoff was at the very end when he turned into Slipper Man, which was a kind of strange, bulbous creature, and if you've been waiting to see if there was going to be a sting in the tail, there was. Yeah, Gabriel had become a, a wonderful showman, and possibly the lamb suffered from the, the fact of being conceived too much with the, the stage show in mind. The lamb lies down on Broadway, showed that Gabriel and the band were finding it increasingly difficult to work together to the same end. It wasn't so much Peter Gabriel's showmanship that was a problem for The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. It was more the unwieldy concept that he constructed that he hadn't really mapped out in advance. It's been looked upon as the climax to Genesis' career. I'm not sure I would say it was that, and obviously another chapter of the band was, was to come anyway. But certainly it's um, something that people feel with the two albums preceding it was one of the magic trilogy, one of the albums that Genesis with Peter Gabriel will always be remembered for.
I think Dance on a Volcano works in musical terms um, because although it's in 7-4, which is in the regular time signature, um, it doesn't sound like it. It still has a great lilt and a great feel to it. These pieces, you can't really um, think, OK, I'm going to write a song in 7-4 and then start work on it. You just come up with a riff and then it happens to be in 7-4 or whatever it is in. It grabs you instantly, the riff. The song itself has a real good pace to it, yeah, and a real, real sort of strong melodies, great, great introduction to the album. It was a group composition, it had some quirky counter rhythms, but it was also reasonably commercial. The guitar sounds and the Mellotron sounds really complement one another at the end, so it takes it to a, to a really nice finish, so I think it's a great musical package. It stayed in the stage set of the band until the 90s, which none of the other songs on this album did. So that's testimony, really, to its appeal. The grandeur of the music is sort of um, to do with the, the fact that it's in, it's in a, um, a flat key, B flat major, um, and it moves through major intervals. But you've got this kind of ambiguity between the major seventh, um, if I can demonstrate, um, the chords, the bass line moves down from B flat down to A flat. But the actual melody, the top moves down from B flat to A, so you get that kind of that major seventh, and the ambiguity. And Tony Banks uses that chord a lot in his in his work. Interestingly, Dance on a Volcano and Squonk were the first two songs they started to do. When they got into the studio, they they got their music together and they went into the studio to do it. But Steve Hackett wasn't there for the first two weeks, and they put down Dance on a Volcano and Squonk pretty much without him. But in view of what would happen with Steve Hackett uh, quite shortly afterwards, it, it's quite revealing that they, the three of them got the sound together quite, quite quickly. The first assumption was that Genesis were finished. Um, and then the next assumption was, so what is Peter doing? So all the attention was on Peter, and Genesis were widely perceived to be finished. I certainly think people must have thought, where, where are they going to go now? When Genesis lost Peter Gabriel, they really lost more than a frontman. He was also the lyricist, he was the face of the band to many people. I mean, I know that they were looking for a singer, and, but the singer was there all the time, and they, they realised that. But yeah, I mean, how do you follow something like that? It was almost as if... Jethro Tull had lost Ian Anderson or Led Zeppelin had lost Robert Plant. It was that much of a potential loss. Peter Gabriel had his wacky kind of out there attitude, you know, he was very theatrical and his costume played a huge role in his makeup and, you know, he was really something, something else. Genesis had always been perceived really as a vehicle for Peter Gabriel's lyrical flights of fantasy and his um, concepts. Um, which in truth was never ever the case. Everybody had collaborated on lyrics in Genesis with Peter Gabriel. They were confident they had the music. And in fact, by the time the rest of the world knew that Genesis no longer featured Peter Gabriel, the band had written pretty much all of A Trick of the Tale. So they were feeling fairly confident about it. It was different, but it was still them. Yeah, I was amazed, because I love the album. It's one of my favorite albums. I think it was an incredible work, you know, to, for them to come out with that under the pressure that must have been in. I still listen to it now and it still blows me away like it did, you know, when I was, when I was a kid. You know, wonderful piece of work. And to, to, to pull that off without Gable in the, in the situation they're in, you know, it's, it just shows, that, you know, the kind of talent and the resilience of the band. The departure in sound for A Trick of the Tale came really because, because the band were more confident in the music they were writing. They knew how to write good, soundtrack material, which is what they'd always written for Peter Gabriel. Um, now they had a chance to push that music to the foreground a bit, which they did, and they felt much less constrained. They also, for the first time, went out and got themselves a proper producer. And he really pushed the sound of the band. He, he divided it up, saw what was good about it, and got it down in the studio properly.
trick of the tail, the right hand is, is almost playing the steady rhythm, rhythmic part, um, the kind of to set the tempo, and then the left hand is doing the complicated syncopated bit where it's, um, it's moving up and down the scale against, crossing over against the beat, so kind of a... So the, the left hand is moving much more um, than a left hand would normally move. Trick of the Tail is an important track in as much as the band named an album after it, and it's got a typically quirky Genesis type plot of a strange creature coming in the midst of people and them not quite being able to cope with it. There's a lot of fantasy imagery involved which is reflected on the album cover. It's not a song that should be taken too seriously really. They got no horns, they got no tails, they don't really know of our existence. Am I really wrong to believe in the city of gold that lies in the distance? Quite dark, I mean, God knows what that's about. They had written it and not decided who they wanted as a singer. Ideas were passed around. Um, Mick Rogers from Man for Man's Earth Band, um, he was one who came for an audition. Jess Roden was another. And he could do it, um, but in that totally British way, he was, he was expecting to be asked to do it. I mean, I know he'd sung bits and bats, you know, he'd sang a song earlier on and bits of melody lines like harmonies and stuff. Yeah, I mean, people must have been shocked in a way, like, probably the last thing they expected, you know, was a drummer for a start. With all the jokes about drummers that applied then and probably apply now. Um, so you didn't think of your drummer as being a singer or indeed indeed of being a musician. When I first joined the band, it was, um, I was kind of viewed as class clown, you know, because I, mean, I, I was a kind of um, a scapegoat, you know, which is fine, because, I mean, like, drummer's role, which is what I was at the time, a drummer's role is very defined, it's like a goalkeeper, you know, I mean, it's like, he's, he's there to really present the vibe, you know, you give the band the energy with the playing on the drums and the sort of humorous and the sort of personality vibe, then the band will sort of, you know, bounce off it. Apparently how it went was when one promising audition turned into another studio debacle um, and Phil sort of came round from behind the drums and said, <coughs> um, actually I, I quite like a shot at this. They kept it in the family there and they didn't lose any credibility with it, you know, fantastic album. I can see why one might say it's kind of wistful or melancholic and there are moments of course. I think it's all sort of kind of more moving and poignant and sort of more intimate and personal actually. The sadness of it, you know, it's just incredible. The trick of the tale has got its fair share of melancholy in it, but then again, all Genesis albums do. I think that, that, that one of the things that makes that album in particular work so well is because of its consistency. Um, nothing really div diverts much from the, the actual, the earthy vibe. Very memorable tunes. You, you always, you'll never forget them, you know, you hear them and they're there. It also began to show a lot of Phil Collins' humour in tracks like Robbery, Assault and Battery. But then you'd get at the other end of the spectrum a track like Ripples with its musing on the passing of time. The arrangements are more fulsome. You take a song like Entangled where there's much more going on. In Entangled we've got the, the major seventh chord again. Um, and a, a, such a beautiful, poignant riff. It's a D major, I think it's in. Um, but the first, the first note starts, and then you get that major seventh, that C sharp over the D, and that ringing out. And so we've got the whole riff, which goes, and really kind of flirts with that major seventh continuously. Normally, you'd have a D chord, and then everybody else, in a sense, would kind of do something along the lines of these those three notes, the notes that are in the card, but uh, Tony Banks goes for the, that really dreamy major seventh sound again. And then he also moves down for the verse, which is in B minor, which is the relative major. So you, but you still get that, that C sharp ringing out over the B minor. So we're moving between the sadness of the B minor and then the kind of almost relief, but dreamy kind of melancholy of the D major with the C sharp in.
didn't get many bands covering songs like that, you know, because it was so, so the musicianship was so brilliant, you know, it was just, they were just, they weren't showing off as musicians because everything fitted with the music, but it was like just, just the power of what they could do. Live, it became a very dramatic part of their show. It comes crashing in with these, with, with, with this drumming and this really frenzied percussion really setting the scene and driving all the way. It's great, there's a sort of, yeah, there's sort of typical Genesis English idiosyncratic sort of odd time signatures that is Genesis. Um, it's a sort of fanfare to declare that the whole album is, is done. It's one of those things that came up out of a jam and they liked it so much they thought this would be a good way to end an album. And certainly as a live track it had a lot of mileage. Rhythmically, Phil Collins is absolutely a force to be reckoned with, you know, that there the, the probably aren't many drummers that are out there that are better than Phil Collins. They had a very uh, a dry sort of, like I say, again, organic sound to them, you know, I mean, it wasn't big, bright production like, like we hear later on, but, um, yeah, I mean, I loved that sound, you know, and, and he's an incredible drummer, again, you know, a phenomenal musician. By employing two drum kits, um, live it was a fairly new concept um, obviously you'd need the two drummers needed to be very very in tune with each other i think the use of uh, double drum sets certainly uh, as a visual thing on stage was, was was brilliant you know it looks great yeah it was, it was a pretty you know pretty exciting time um, i mean when you listen to it now it sounds maybe slightly over the top could be dangerous but it works brilliantly with genesis the reason it could be dangerous is because immediately people think it's too busy but if they're working together rather than singly it works brilliantly Most of the time, Phil was out front, singing. And then, when he'd finished singing, he would quite often nip back to the drums, and then the two of them, and you could see their eyes light up as they sort of looked at each other and thought, yes, now. And off they went. It's very strange, when you live in London, or live around London, and you get the music papers and things, you are, you are led to believe that there is a certain type of music that is popular, and everything else is not. Um, and yet, if you actually ask the punters, they'll, they'll, you know, our, the people that come to see our gigs, that will go and see Motorhead, you know, they'll go and buy a Clash album. Uh, they'll go and see Susan the Banshees, you know, and they'll also come and see us. I mean, like, I mean, it's like the same as me, I like Weather Report, I like Stephen Bishop, you know, I like John Martin, I mean, I like, I mean, I just like all different kinds of, 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 of music and artists, and it's the same with fans. I mean, each time we go and do an album, we try and actually say, well, let's not do it 
You know, let's not do it like Genesis. You try and be as different as we can. It, it, is, it is hard. I mean, as soon as we start sort of going down, I dare say we'll start thinking about whether we're doing the right thing. But at the moment, we're writing music that we like and other people like as well. So, you know, as long as more people get, keep getting to it, then uh, that's fine. Because they had proved their point with the trick of the tail, which was far more successful than um, a lamp, the lamb lies down on Broadway in sales terms. So in every sense, um, Genesis had made their point. Um, and in fact, people were now beginning to say, uh, where's Peter gone? Going in a slightly different direction, you know, taking things probably a little bit more to the progressive extreme, working with sort of longer pieces of music, songs that are, are similar to the songs on Trick of the Tail and could also um, fit in there somewhere with the Trick of the Tail vibe because they are of a similar kind of feel. There's the freedom to try things and, and the space to do it which they didn't have before or at least they felt they didn't have before. Now they, they were more relaxed about it, they could come to the studio, work their, work their ideas through, they felt confident about the people in the studio with them, they were choosing them. Th there was really much less tension all the way around. The 11th Earl of Mar is a great opener to what is a good album. They really chose wisely in, in putting this at the top again. Great decision by Genesis to do, to do that. The production is remarkable for the time. Um, you know, when, at the time when I first heard it, I thought it was a little bit cluttered, but reviewing it now, it's really stood the test of time. And it's just very high-tech, high-end, classy, um, fusion-y, but without being too fussy. It starts off um, with a really sinister chord. It's almost like the SIM card um, the, of James Bond, that, good evening Mr Bond. Um, it's a, kind of an um, E minor, but with a major seven, so you get that kind of sadness of the minor. You also get the mysterious laziness um, of, the, of that major seventh over a minor chord. It's a very, very peculiar chord, never ever heard before in popular music. Um, so we've got that, the root note, and then instead of coming in with a note at the top, like... Like most people would do, like most people would go for a, a note of the actual chord, Tony Banks goes for the major seventh note to start on. So instead of that note, we get this note. Which is very, very unnerving and uh, kind of... Um, ominous that something is going to happen and so we get that movement very mysterious and then of course the bass note moves up as well so you get this kind of um We get this fantastic change of chord and key. Very, very dramatic. Eleventh Earl of Mar was a very good opening to Wind and Wuthering, largely because it has a very Peter Gabriel type echo to it, and it could well be a bridge between the old music and the new. Admittedly, this was not the first album that Peter Gabriel hadn't appeared on, 
but its predecessor had been an album where they expected somebody else to sing. Probably one of my favourites, Blood on the Rooftops, I think, maybe, you know, which was a Hackett, well, at least the music, Steve Hackett, you know, was a great guitarist. So Steve Hackett's guitar playing um, was very, very um, important to the Genesis sound. In That Quiet Earth is one of my favourite songs because it, it um, encapsulates exactly what Genesis were about. The connection that he made with the music and his input was just, um, was just perfect for the song. Wind and Wuthering, though, is really Tony Banks' album. The centrepiece of it is One for the Vine, which he spent nearly a year writing and putting together. This track follows the path that, um, almost follows the path that the opera composer would take. There's downright pastoral moments where the lead vocal drops out. End of each verse, Phil Collins comes down, you know, in melody. He, he descends in melody, and, and the lyric is... is it's almost like a depressing lyric, it's an afterthought. And then the second half of the song, it goes into this almost kind of 5-4, 3-4 phrase. And then the band comes crashing back in, um, playing a series of riffs, go round and round, the vocal is reintroduced, weaves into a more sort of quasi-orchestral sort of outro, which contains classic Genesis sort of prog rock tendencies. Some people say it's the best song he ever wrote, and certainly the melody and the rhythm um, interact in a, in a way that makes it perhaps an epic. Um, obviously Phil Collins is the rhythm man and I would suspect that many hours were spent honing it and bringing it to the shape in which we now know it. The other high point of the album is the other big Tony Banks song which was Afterglow. Afterglow is possibly my personal favourite mid-period Genesis track. It's very complete, it's lush, and its musicianship, its, its musical quality very much um, complements the lyric, which is one of those unusual romantic lyrics that Genesis don't really seem to specialise in. So in the song Afterglow, um, it's in G major, a really nice key for a guitar, big open G chords, um, and again we've got the major seventh. Um, if I just demonstrate the chords... <laughs> G major 7, and then it moves up to a C, but then that major turns to minor. It's quite a common trick um, used by the Beatles and, and lots of other people, um, but very sad. The major turning to minor, and then back to G. The major 7th, and then we get F, and then D with an F sharp at the top so they kind of, you get this kind of chromatic moving back up to G. So the whole thing the key change there, very un unsuspected, um, moving up to E major. Um, and, and a lot of composers would not really have the courage or confidence to be able to just shift to another key just, just like that. But then, as usual, Phil Collins keeps it very tough on the rhythm track, on the drums in particular, and the arrangement is quite hard and positive. It's um, almost like one of the anthem songs that they have, and particularly one I know that um, people 
like to come after a huge epic number in a Genesis set? He's a genius, the guy's a phenomenal player, technically incredibly able, but a great writer and a great craftsmith, a great song crafter. And he's, 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 again, he's playing, he's just, he's just great, you know, it's, it's a real pleasure to listen to and he's got a real style of his own. You know that it's, it's Tony Banks playing when you hear it. I think in his early days he was actually an organist to begin with and there's something about the way an organist plays to a pianist and there's a lot of melodies that come through that wouldn't necessarily come from a classical pianist. I think you can say that Tony Banks is the keeper of the Genesis musical keys, if you like, if they're, if they're covered. Um, he has always held that sway. Uh, my role is definitely as a writer, um, you know. I'm not, I mean, I'm not a very natural performer, but in a group nowadays, you've got to kind of contain all the different aspects within, within the group. Um, in the old days, I suppose, there used to be writers who never performed and performers who never wrote. It's amazing to note that Wind and Wuthering followed a trick of the tale ten months on. How many top bands these days would release two great albums within the space of a year? Wind and Wuthering is a step up from Trick of the Turtle, and I think it's one of the most underrated prog rock albums, really, certainly in the Genesis package. Tony Banks certainly thinks that Wind and Wuthering is one of Genesis' best ever albums. I think it's his personal favourite, probably because he contributed rather a lot to it himself. But uh, I would say it certainly sees the band hitting their stride. <laughs> Seconds Out was a necessary evil in putting set pieces like The Cinema Show and Supper's Ready to bed. They were songs that Genesis fans were used to hearing with Peter Gabriel and they expected them to be performed. I think Seconds Out, in a way, did lay Gabriel's ghost to rest. Um, it, was, it, it was a much needed album. It was a brilliant album. I don't think there'd be too many Genesis fans out there who would dispute that. Comparing Peter Gabriel and Phil Collins is very difficult, largely because Peter Gabriel, I still believe, is one of the most unique performers we have in British rock. Phil Collins grew into the role. Obviously, he had the artful Dodger film appearance to fall back on, and he knew his way about. But in his defence, he's never really tried to be Peter Gabriel Mark II. Seconds Out shows that Phil Collins can be Peter Gabriel. Without the masks, um, without the long convoluted introductions, um, he can sing Peter Gabriel. He doesn't do it the way Peter Gabriel did, but then he couldn't. When the two of them met at Milton Keynes in the reunion concert, Peter is re reputed to have said to Phil, you can sing the songs better than I can, but you can't sing them like I can. And I think that possibly sums it up. For those who were not into Peter's conceptual intricacies, um, Phil Collins lightens the whole thing. He has a more of a kind of lighter, sort of humorous approach, does um, Phil Collins, doesn't he? They were perceived before as being a progressive rock band that, that you sort of needed to be reading the lyrics as you listened to them. Suddenly this had gone.
got to bear in mind is that this time in rock music, live albums were the big thing. They were a very, very important marketing tool. Very much affirmed that these were rock bands, not pop acts, that were out there live on the road, probably tour on the road, touring six months a year, and the public just were lapping them up. I really believe that at this point, the band were almost at the pinnacle of their craft. I think by that time, they, they, they probably felt fairly comfortable without Gabriel and they knew that their fan base was still there, loyal, and people were enjoying what they were doing. At that time, I think they were using the light show and Genesis have always been at the forefront of light shows. Um, I think they always realised that they were very much a theatrical band, that in fact the music was the soundtrack to a story. Um, and then as the stories became less important or moved into other spheres, they realised that it was the visual element that was important to them. And they'd always done that. You've got to have the music, you've got to design, you can't just throw lights at anything. And you know, when you've got something like that with the light show, it's just, it's, it's brilliant. It's just a whole experience, a whole, it's more two-dimensional, three-dimensional experience as opposed to just something being there. The lights out there to light the band, to, to blow your mind as well, at the right moment, on the right moment of a song with its slow, fast, medium person. These, were, these guys were craftsmen at that. The band were very keen to record Seconds Out because the production on early albums had been rather patchy and they felt that by doing the, uh, the material again live with recording techniques that existed in the late 70s they could produce far better music on, in quality so in some ways the band felt that these were definitive performances. It's a great example of how much emphasis and focus was put on the drums. There were big, powerful drum fills, which nowadays would sound very, very busy and very sort of cluttered. Rhythmically, Phil Collins, for me particularly at times, I, I feel that he's a little busier than I would like to hear a drummer. But at the time, it generated some great excitement, and Phil Collins was a master of that kind of drumming. Seconds Out was the last album that, that Steve Hackett uh, appears on. But by the end of the recording of Wind and Wuthering, he had pretty much decided he didn't want to deal with it anymore. He found that he was submitting songs um, which were then getting rejected by, by the others. Particular case in point, he came um, with a, a song called Please Don't Touch, um, which they practiced and suddenly Phil Collins said, nope, can't get behind that, and they dropped it. Well, that song turns out to be the lead track on uh, Steve Hackett's second solo album. So he clearly felt strongly about that, and the fact that the rest of the band rejected it, I think emphasised to him that there was a gulf between them. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm ready. Hey, I'm looking forward to that one. Hey, I can feel it. I can feel it. Can you feel it? I can feel it. I can't do 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 it
Oh, is that professional? What's happening? What's happening? Yeah, it does. Is that the house, right? Deep in the Mother Load was the opening track on side two of the album. If anyone can these days remember plastic records, vinyl records, you obviously had to turn the album over. And if the opening track of side two wasn't punchy and grab your attention, then you would probably go off and make a cup of tea or have a beer. Um, so really what this track had to do was grab the attention again and make sure that you were really hooked into what was going on. And you're rolling the days right. Suddenly down to the three of them, um, they found a new dynamic. Um, and there is a dynamic about three people in a band rather than four. I don't quite know what it is, but if you think of it, the great three-piece bands all have something special. You go back to Cream, you take the police. But the four-piece band, you can start breaking off into factions almost at once. Uh, you can't do that with a three-piece band, and it sort of solidified them. Five people, as we were when we started, um, developing as sort of personalities, expanding as, as writers and musicians, need more room. And we could barely contain five, and now, uh, then we were four for a while, and they kind of developed, and you could barely contain that. And now there's three of us, and the, the, there's a lot more room. By the time of Then There Were Three, Genesis had their fans. They also had the detractors, because Steve Hackett had left, Peter Gabriel had left, and certain fans had left with them. I think that they were uh, well publicised rift with Steve Hackett and obviously the album title tells you well okay they're slightly having a, a small snipe at him. By now of course they're feeling fairly confident things are on the up so there's no question of replacing Steve Hackett they now have the confidence that they can do this with the three of them. And then there were three again I loved it absolutely loved the stuff. Suddenly there's a swing to Genesis that was never there before you can click your fingers almost. Different slant, more brighter produced album, more kind of more bright reverb on the vocals, but some beautiful songs on there, you know, kind of a lot shorter the songs. If a song feels good three minutes long, then we'll leave it at three minutes, you know, because there are some things you just can't stretch out for the sake of it. You know, it just, it just feels right at that, that, uh, that length. From first to last, there's not a weak track on it, but then again, there are no real career highlights that you would look back on and say, 
this was Genesis' greatest moment. Certainly the business heads, Tony Smith, their manager, hit and run their record label and publishing company, were probably very happy to hear after sort of six albums, seven albums, an album that was much more aimed at the commercial jugular. You've got Mike Rutherford left to do the guitars there, but I thought he did a great job. Mike Rutherford was certainly engrossed in his guitar work. Um, he'd never been a lead guitarist, and suddenly he had to be one. He rose to that challenge admirably, actually. I think Mike Rutherford's use of bass pedals was, uh, was great, in, in particular in, uh, in Duke's End, you know, where he really boosts it up. It just it gives, it, it gives it that extra, extra kick, extra bottom end. They were very similar to the bass pedals of an organ, uh, which enabled an organist to play the two manuals of an organ with both hands, but also to be able to play the bass parts with his feet. There were only three of them, so uh, this, this, was, this was kind of crucial. A couple of simple presses um, would have great effect, there's sort of awesome power and make everything sound very big rock and very kind of, you could make a three-piece band sound like um, a couple of bass guitarists and a couple of guitarists playing heavy power chords at the bottom end. It was kind of, there was that and many too many that were kind of, I guess the first time you would imagine that, that the female audience would get interested, you know, love songs. Follow You, Follow Me um, is actually one of my all-time favourite songs. It's kind of a backdrop for my uh, upbringing. My, my parents used to listen to, uh, then there were three, quite a lot. In Follow You, Follow Me, um, we've got a wonderful, simple, yet very catchy melody um, in the chorus. Um, if I could just demonstrate... Um, just four notes, but very simple, um, but again in G major, very nice open key for the guitar, um, and very, very simple, but then later on in the chorus, the kind of the left hand moves to the relative minor, to E minor, so we get that really sad sound, so... Um, It's hard to say why it works musically. I mean, um, I'm surprised that it's so beloved by uh, Genesis fans. Um, I think that must have been their most commercial song to date. If you ask our ardent fans what they think of it, they'll say, oh, it's the group single. You know, it's obviously a commercial single, but I mean, to me, that's one of the hippest things we've ever done. You know? And I, I mean, the way it was written, was because it was out of improvisation, it was a blow, basically. It just sort of honed itself into this sort of verse, chorus, verse, chorus, chorus, verse. You know? And um, the attitude behind it was totally, you know, on the level. In fact, the producer, David Henschel, didn't even want it on the album. He thought it was so weak that it shouldn't, it, that it was so un-Genesis, it shouldn't be on a Genesis album. To the punters, I suppose, they, they sort of see it as their band trying to get a hit single, you know, and we've, we've never really needed that. I mean, in America you need that, but also in America you're more likely to have a hit single with something that's, you know, related to what you do anyway, so. Music from our album called Duke. <laughs>
think it's, it is a very transitional album, but it is moving towards um, as it, what you might call the, um, the 80s era genesis. It came after the band had nearly broken up, caused by Phil Collins' marriage collapse. Um, he actually moved to Canada to try and save his marriage. In fact, Phil Collins' marriage collapsed anyway. So he comes back two months later and says, um, well, it's, it's all over, so let's carry on. There was definitely a new feeling about them. There, there was a new sense of bonding. They sat in Phil's bedroom and jammed constantly. And at the end of the day, they'd go back, listen to the tapes, see what they liked, and that's where Behind the Lines and Turn It On Again um, and Duchess all came from jams like that. And they were able then to fill out the sound. And it, it's the beginning of, of the new 80s Genesis sound. defining moment in electronic use within rock music. Throughout the 80s there was a huge influx in, uh, in electronic drum sounds and percussion. People were experimenting with all sorts of electronic sounds. The use of the drum machine on Duchess is interesting because the band actually jammed it up in rehearsal and to actually be playing to a drum machine in that way was perhaps indicative of Genesis looking for new ways of working. I think what's important here is that they don't overuse it. They use it in collaboration with live drums on this particular track. So it works really well. The synth parts are great, really great. I mean, I must admit, I was never that big a fan of Tony Banks, but in retrospect, he was, he was some excellent parts, and that's combined with the electronic drum beats as well. It gives the whole thing a very hypnotic, electronica type of feel, which was quite revolutionary. I mean, you hear it now a lot, of course, but there weren't any loops um, at the time. So it was an early, early uh, foray into electronica. Um, to very good effect, I believe. Brand new single from Genesis from the album Duke, a track called Duchess. How are you viewing uh, the prospect of local audience for two nights? The talents you, you know are going to be good and kind of rely on. There are supposed to be several hundred forged tickets in circulation. I mean, yeah, how do you thought that? According to the fans, out, the, the guys outside said seven or eight thousand. But I think you said seven or eight hundred. I think seven or eight thousand is a bit It'll topic. be a couple of million by the time we get down to the gig. <laughs> does, does, does that, does that well, cause yeah. a problem, presumably, before the gig then? I mean, when. If, if the tickets are having to be checked that thoroughly before the kids are coming in, yeah. then I'm not slow. The process of people coming in very slow, which means we go on later. Mm. Which means there's more risk of us being drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is an afternoon radio show. That's
Turn It On Again. Um, what a great track. I think that's probably my favourite Genesis track. Turn It On Again has an almost rhythm and blues type edge in the old fashioned sense of the term, which made it particularly palatable to American audiences who are now beginning to wake up to what they've been missing in Genesis. I'll never forget the first time I heard it uh, on American radio. I just couldn't believe it. I knew that it was Genesis because of uh, Collins' voice, but I couldn't quite accept it because it's just, it's magnificent. It also, typically with anything involving Phil Collins, has a very rhythmic feel. And in fact, it's in 13-4 time, which possibly makes it unique among, uh, if not Genesis music, then hit singles. It crashes in with all this driving um, bass notes. You know, it's, it's what, what, what creates the tension is this pedal note, continual pedal note from the bass and the guitar just staying on the one note, the drums building it up. It's quite hard to follow where the, uh, the, 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 the rhythm drops along with the vocal. They almost seem to clash, but it's perfect. It's the classic rock track, simple as that. By now they're starting to take in more musical influences. Some of the influences have come at them from people like Chester Thompson and Daryl Sturmer who were American musicians who'd come in and although they weren't contributing on record, um, they were touring with, with the band and obviously th there was an impact going down. And suddenly there's a new sort of swing to their music, a new, which in itself breeds its own confidence and you can hear it right from the beginning of the album. I think Duke's End is a, is a really successful track for the reason that it's a classic prog rock song. It's a farewell fanfare. It's saying, that's it folks, you know, we've given our best, this is, we believe this is a great album. Genesis always liked it to end albums on a high, and with Duke, which had a certain semi-concept running through it, Duke's travel and Duke's end was almost like the full stop at the end of the album, the buffers at which the train finished. It still shows, even at this stage, although it was getting more scarce, that they had that magic ingredient to, to really rock out, to really go for it. It's very hard with new material, trying to introduce new material to an audience because people basically come to a concert to have a confirmation, you know, and they like, they feel safe with what they're hearing and they like to hear the songs they know because then they can, go, they can sing along with them, you know, and if you give them too much new material, luckily our album has been doing very, very well, so the people, all our fans that are coming to see the gigs know it. You have to reach some kind of climax. I think you might see Genesis together for one more concert. I think there's a feeling that it sort of ended rather messily. Once Phil decided he didn't want to be in Genesis anymore, at that point they should have knocked it on the head really, I think. Whether we would see another new album from Genesis, who knows?